Hello, greetings from China. Happy Springathon. It's like in the transition season here, rainy and warm, but not hot yet. So spring ish. Um, and I thought today would be super fun to get started. Obviously I want to get started, but I'm going to do a try a chapter tag with my four picks for Springathon. So the prompts this year are the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. And I thought it would be kind of funny to, you know, get out of my pajamas. Like you, you guys rarely see that, right? <laughs> but I thought that I would put on, you know, a seasonally appropriate outfit for every book and challenge myself to make all the outfits bookish. I think I can do it. Okay, so let's get started with the first read, shall we? So, spring, obviously, spring. Oops, not that one. This is the only one I have in physical form, so I'm gonna go get changed and read the first chapter and check back in with you. Okay, I've already screwed up my little bookish plan. However, I do have, you know, nature represented in the bee motif. And I have a little school paraphernalia that I'll show you now. So yeah, there is my school library pen and Gabriel's school pen. So that's bookish content. And this book, oh my gosh. Just a moment, just a moment. Bee socks and my new um, Converse from Macau. Okay, this one is going to be freaking fabulous. I only read the prologue, but I am totally sucked in. It's one of those books that combines science and history, which I absolutely love. Uh, and each chapter is dedicated to a different orchid and a person who was associated with that orchid. So it's gonna be super easy to read. I will probably just read one a day um, because they're self-contained chapters, you know what I mean? And I'm gonna show you some of the beautiful pictures and read the introduction because <laughs> totally, totally captivated me. So anyway, I'm super duper excited about this one, ready to dive in, but you know, pacing myself with it, you know? I think it's gonna be a good one for the two week duration of Springathon. Okay, so I only read the prologue, but that was more than enough. You can see um, the first <laughs> part one is sex, part two is science, uh, part three is business, and part four is culture. So orchid delirium. There is nothing quite like the raw sexuality of an orchid. We're reminded of their carnality by the flower's entomological roots. Did I say that right? Anyway, moving on. The family is named for orchid, orchis, an ancient Greek word for testicle. The vanilla orchid, being little pod in Spanish, stemming from the Latin for vagina, references the impregnated bean that gives birth to vanilla seeds. The swollen pod's luscious scent, long thought to be an aphrodisiac. Humans throughout time have imagined a spectrum of sexual organs in these blooms. So, loved the art in the first chapter. So, this book, quality, quality, paper quality, and the you know, way it's put together. I love that she touches on orchids and people, cultures throughout the world. So, I don't think it's going to be... Um, Eurocentric or North American even. So yeah, gorgeous, right? Don't you want to run out and grab it? I also can't wait to finish this because I think, okay, Frida, I see you. I think this is going to be a lovely addition to my school's library. Um, most of my nonfiction, if it's, you know, what I think will get read there, I donate to the school library. So yeah, oh, so beautiful, I cannot wait. Okay, on to the next one. Okay, welcome summer. Obviously we need sunglasses and flip 
flip-flops. I do have a bookish t-shirt on now. I got this at H&M here in China, New York. Hello, I see you. <laughs> okay, I already screwed up again. Um, Orchid Muse was actually my summer pick because obviously the Sakura Obsession would be my spring pick, obviously. And this is the group read for Springathon as well as the May read for the book Naturalist Book Club. I will link all of the ladies who are participating as hosts in Springathon this year below. They've put out some excellent contact content. I'll link their um, most recent videos below that I just watched this morning and got a lot of great ideas from. So the Sakura Obsession is a man uh, from England, Collingsworth? Anyway, his last name is Ingram. And he was a naturalist. Uh, he was a teen during World War One, and, um, you know, a, a, a patriot. He didn't fight, but uh, he was a patriot in England during World War Two. But in the interim, spent a lot of time in Japan and traveling worldwide, um, pursuing his naturalist benders. And he became obsessed with the Sakura blossoms and collected them. And the introduction was fabulous. So uh, the woman that wrote this is a Japanese journalist. And interestingly enough, um, I mean, obviously she wrote the book originally in Japanese for Japan. It was published in 2016, but some, you know, international audience was at one of her book signings and were like, when is it coming out in English? And so this edition actually is an extended version because she felt like she had to do a lot more cultural explaining. For example, the Kura Blossom observation window, you know, how that is such a big um, national pastime in Japan. And just added more things that she found to the text. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed her writing style. Um, I only listened to the introduction, so I'm having to listen to this one on Audible. That's the only place that I could find it available to me uh, and really enjoyed. It was about 20 minutes. And this is just going to be, you know, the history from, you know, the turn of the century, I guess, through uh, the Second World War and beyond. And talked about ideology and why the Sakura Blossom became, you know, just one strain became so prominent in Japan and how you know, this guy Ingram saved a lot of the um, wild varieties and just a lot of varieties of the Sakura Blossom and how they were, I guess, I haven't gotten there, but I'm assuming some were had, had to be reintroduced to Japan, but really excited about this one too. Oh, this is gonna be a great, great couple of weeks or even month, we'll see, we'll see. Okay, on to fall. Okay, this is the grunge look from, you know, the 90s when I was in university. <laughs> yeah, I might be cheating again. I'm pretending that this is a manga cat, but to be honest, I have absolutely no idea. But yeah. Oh, and these are my Converse from Taiwan. I am back into the Converse scene again. It started last summer when I got the white ones in Canada. Um, I quit wearing them for a while when my back was bothering me because you know, I'm older like that, but I think they've, they've added cushioning. I think they have, but also my back is better. So, you know, anyway, on, on to the books. Doesn't everyone keep their Christmas tree on their balcony? <laughs> So for fall, we have What an Owl Knows by Jennifer Ackerman. I read the introduction to this one as well. And really, I didn't even need to do that. I've, this is probably my third Jennifer Ackerman. And she's a very reliable author. So this one is very niche. It's focusing um, on the owl. And I think it's going to be a lot of the science of the owl. Uh, just how it communicates, different adaptations, 
how it's more diverse than you think it is. She focuses on new sciences that have helped uh, study and research this enigmatic animal more and, you know, local people that are, you know, um, healing injured owls and learning uh, through that close association. And also some, you know, figures in history like Roosevelt. So a little bit of history sprinkled into this one as well. Um, fun fact, the owl and the orchid are both on every continent except for Antarctica. So yeah, Jennifer Ackerman is a great author. So I highly recommend you pick up any of her works. This is just her latest and perfect for fall. So now on to winter. Okay, we got a winner. This is a legit bookish ensemble. Reading is my weekend, yes. Ready for winter here and have my little Italian loafers and my Chinese cat socks. China makes the best socks. Okay, time for bookish content. Okay, so for winter, I have chosen The End of Drum Time by Hannah Pilvanen. So this is the only uh, fiction on my list for Springathon, but fiction is totally allowed. You read what you want. It's just nature focused writing. So this one is set in um, Scandinavia, uh, Finland, I think, but in the 1850s. So you've got a Lutheran minister who has been serving there for 22 years and you know his family is in the congregation he says he his family makes up 10 of the 40 regular members um you know being such a harsh lengthy area to cover uh, a lot of people only come on the major holidays um <laughs> he also sells liquor <laughs> Even during the service, you can sneak off and buy some. So he's brought his nephew there to work in sales. And it is going to focus, I believe, on his daughter, Willa. So there's a beautiful passage about her that I want to read to you. Um, but yeah, so his congregation is, I think he said, 25% um, Finnish. And then the rest are um, the Laplanders or Sami. So he says that if he's speaking to Swedes, he calls them Laplanders. And if he's speaking to the Sami, he calls them Sami. Um, and yeah, I think opening scene um, is at church. And there are more people there than usual because they've been taking up this new... Um, bent in the church speaking in tongues and a lot of people are coming to see it happening and while they were during the church service um the town drunk so to speak comes in and lays down on the floor and then there's an earthquake it's quite dramatic so the writing was gorgeous i think this is one that asks to be read slowly so hopefully i'll read it slowly over the course of the month um but I wanted to read a couple of those passages to you before I sign off because the writing here is quite superb. The day of the earthquake was the darkest day of the year. This far north, what counted as day was just twilight stretched thin so that no shadows fell. And the steeple of the church made no impression on the snow. And the river and forests and hills were all suspended in the same half-finished light. The effect of this was a shared if unexpressed uneasiness but most people were used to it. If given the choice, they would have said, let there be darkness and gone back to their work. That was the sentiment anyway, around people who had grown up here, Lars Levi among them. He found the cold and the dark invigorating. He was a man of extremes, and so he was drawn to extremes. They suited him, they spurred him on. But even he had to admit the morning was off kilter somehow. And then the daughter, <clears throat> At the door, his daughter turned to see why he had stopped speaking. She thought, even from this distance, that he looked sick, 
though she knew he wasn't. She was familiar with the sight of him, his near hysteric states. Actually, Willa envied him, how he loosed himself on people like that. She herself was nothing beyond or below, well behaved, quiet in the evenings, diligent about her chores, always first to offer to go out for wood or put the cow in the cow house or pluck or skin whatever needed to be plucked or skinned, even copying her father's sermons with ink she mixed from blueberries and soot. But her outwardly manners bore little relationship to her insides. She felt, if anything, she kept herself. Go, damn it. <laughs> oh, the drama. She kept herself. She kept herself contained as she could. I mean, it's beautiful if it's read properly. <laughs> oh God. But her outwardly manners bore little relationship to her insides. She felt, if anything, she kept herself as contained as she could, making herself smaller, quieter, more palatable, like she couldn't scare anyone with who she really was or what she really thought. She had no rebellion in her, though, or none that she ever exercised. She was a kettle left at a gentle boil, and with her heat, she did nothing more than make coffee or tea. As ever then, she did not do what she had been told, but what she knew was wanted, and she opened the door. Outside, the silence was absolute. The snow muffled even the smallest of sounds. So she heard nothing, not the reindeer tied to the posts, not the titmouse in the tree, not the services inside. Right then, the wind was blowing the snow so that the scene was almost picturesque. The ten wooden cabins, most chimneyless, with shutters for windows, Pelts are various kinds, nailed to the plank walls, reindeer, squirrel, fox, even a lynx. Storehouses on their stilts. Wow. Beautiful, right? And you know I'm back in my pajamas. You didn't have to ask. <laughs> See you next time. Bye.